But the major message that seems to come through in Vico's new science is that civilization was, fi was founded by a bunch of sociopaths who figured out a way to enslave other people and then took an oath among themselves, we will never give up, we will never relent, we will hold these bastards in slavery forever. And that is, that is the main theme of Vico's new science. I think that's the major theme that Joyce used in Finnegan's Wake. And everybody writes about Vico's cycle theory, which takes up about 20 pages at the end of the book and is not the most important message in the book. And it's not the message that would interest Joyce. This notion history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awaken is a phrase that I hope some of the literary types are, are familiar with. It's a very famous phrase, happens on page nine uh, of one of my favorite books, Ulysses from uh, James Joyce. Terrorism, the attack on our homeland, back from the attack on our economy and back from the attack on our way of life. Terrorism, terrorists, hate. We must be fierce and relentless and terminate terrorism, terrorists. You defeat them. It yearns to destroy not just the individual, but the entire international order. That's why America is safer with George W. Bush as president. Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden. Terror management theory was uh, originally derived from the ideas of Ernest Becker, who in the 1970s. Uh, wrote a series of books in which he claimed that the uniquely human awareness of death has a great deal to do with just about everything uh, that human beings do day to day. And his argument very simply is that people are the only creatures that are smart enough to recognize that we're here. And if you know that you're here, you also realize that you won't always be around. And on top of that, uh, we realize that we will die someday and that our deaths can occur at any time for reasons that we could never anticipate or control. And we also recognize that we're animals and that whether we like it or not, that we're no more significant or enduring than lizards or potatoes. And uh, according to Becker, all of these realizations uh, would give rise to potentially debilitating terror, but that human beings rather cleverly, although not necessarily consciously, solve this existential dilemma by the creation and maintenance of what anthropologists today call culture. And Becker's point was that human beings construct cultural worldviews, beliefs that we share with other people in our groups that essentially give us a sense that we are individuals of value in a world of meaning and that when we have those beliefs, when we confidently subscribe uh, to a belief that we have meaning and value, that in turn gives us a sense that we can live forever, either literally in the context of different religions that provide the hope for an afterlife, or, or symbolically, just the idea that we may not be here forever, but uh, that tangible representations of our culture will remain nevertheless. We also found that the pro-meritocratic bias was exacerbated by system threat. So that under these circumstances, the studies supporting the American dream were seen as even more convincing and well-conducted than before, and the studies casting doubt on the American dream were seen as even less convincing and less well-conducted, uh, presumably because people are trying, uh, unconsciously, I think, to restore legitimacy to the system following threat. There's a theory that originated from a guy named Leon Fessinger. And he was a research psychologist, and he came up with a theory called the cognitive dissonance theory. Cognitive means idea or truth, and dissonance means disharmony or uncomfortable feeling. And what his theory suggested is that you and I as human beings cannot hold two conflicting viewpoints in our minds at the same time without disharmony occurring. As soon as you make the decision, we start gathering data to support our decision. And so what happens to us, we, you can hold two conflicting viewpoints until they come in conflict. Then you make a decision. And as soon as you make the decision, you gather data to support your decision, called the cognitive dissonance theory. All right, now Becker says, look, if in fact I'm right, if your beliefs about the nature of reality serve a death-denying function, then there's two problems. Problem number one is what happens when you encounter someone who has different beliefs. Right? Becker's point is whether you're aware of it or not, 
the very existence of an alternative conception of reality is fundamentally threatening. Uh, because if you believe something, let's say that God created the earth in six days before taking a well-deserved break on the seventh, and you run into, let's say, someone from the South Pacific where they believe that the earth emerged from a giant coconut shell out of the side of a palm tree, well, there's a problem. Because if you accept the validity of an alternative conception of reality, you do so necessarily by undermining the confidence with which you subscribe to your own perspective. And when you do that, you expose yourself to the very anxiety that your beliefs were constructed to reduce. And when that happens, it instigates a host of compensatory psychological mechanisms that are designed to restore your psychological equanimity. Turn to MSNBC and the experts. U.S. officials tell CNN. Bush officials says that analysts say. Pentagon officials tell us. According to U.S. intelligence. That U.S. officials say. U.S. officials say that. U.S. officials here say. These officials here at the White House tell us. Trust me. Trust me. And by the way, we, we ought to kill those. Uh, those uh, Arabs up there anyhow, otherwise we're going to have to fight them again. We need to invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity. You want to know what I'm doing? Shut up. 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 Shut uh, culture reduces anxiety with respect to death in two ways, uh, which he refers to as lending meaning and conferring significance respectively. So the first thing that Becker says is that what cultures do is to provide their constituents with answers to universal cosmological questions about the nature of life. Where do I come from? What do I do when I'm here? What will happen to me when I'm no longer around? There, there is a wide variety of different cultural constructions, both past and present, but what they all share in common is they offer an account of the origin of the universe, they offer a prescription for how one ought to behave while you're here, they offer an explanation for what happens to you when you die, and they offer some hope of immortality to people who behave in appropriate ways, either symbolically or literally. It's even one of the reasons why we want to have kids. We know on the one hand that we may not be here forever, but we're comforted nevertheless by the prospect that a physical manifestation of ourselves remains nevertheless. I, I used to do all those things at once. I'd be like, I'll, I'll win a gold medal and I'll get a Nobel Prize, and then I'll write a book on the plane over to get it, and so on. But maybe that's just me. Some of you all may be more content for a more modest dose of heroism. The point that Becker makes uh, is that uh, that's not the raving lunacy of a narcissist. It may be in my case, but rather the normal yearning of the human animal. We each want to feel like we serve a valuable and significant role in the universe. And the way that culture allows that, us to pull this off is by the provision of social roles with associated prescriptions of acceptable conduct, the satisfaction of which allows you to perceive yourself as a person of value in a world of meaning. And if you're lucky enough to feel that way, in his language, you have self-esteem. So for Becker, self-esteem is the dominant motive of the human animal. It consists of the belief that you are a person of value in a world of meaning. It is the psychological mechanism by which culture exerts its anxiety-reducing, death-denying influence. Becker goes on to say is, you know what? Even if there weren't different people around to annoy us, we would designate somebody as different because we have to. All right, well, his argument is as follows, as articulated in the Escape from Evil book. What he says is, look, at, at no matter how powerful and convincing your culture is, it is ultimately a symbol. All, all cultural constructs are symbolic. They're human creations. All right. However, death is a very real physical phenomenon. And the point that Becker makes very simply is that no symbol 
regardless of its power or potency, will ever be sufficient to overcome the physical reality of death. It's like mixing apples and oranges. Consequently, and I've got to degenerate into some psychoanalytical language, which is probably okay for some, less so for others. What Becker says, again borrowing from William James, he says, you know what? Therefore, no matter how good your culture is or how much you believe in it, there's always going to be some residual anxiety about death. And you're not aware of that, he claims, because that anxiety is repressed. And then using Freud's ideas, what Becker says is that repressed anxiety is projected onto another group of individuals, either inside or outside of your culture, that you designate as the all-encompassing repository of evil, the eradication of which would make life on earth as it is in heaven. He calls them scapegoats.